Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, welcome. I think we'll probably have a few more uh, coming in and sitting down, but we'll, we'll just let them join us. It's uh, really a privilege for me to be able to um, introduce um, Stephen Silverman, who does not need any introduction to this community, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and also to give you a sense of the context that uh, we are thinking here at Teachers College about many things. Um, you know, we're thinking about the work we do in communities, we're thinking about the professions that we prepare for, but, but really in the heart of this work, we're also thinking about how we prepare to become inquirers, and how, how we can deepen our knowledge and, and our connection with insight into what we're doing. And the research process is so deeply connected with um, understanding what we can do in the professions, how we can have um, a positive impact on human lives, growing and learning. And um, so the preparation of researchers here is really key to, to what we do. And it's part of our social mission. Um, it's related to all of our values in terms of what we want to accomplish. And Steve Silverman is somebody who has thought um, a great deal about that. Um, he is a professor of physical education, um, has um, I think hundreds now of publications um, in that field and in kinesiology and related areas. Um, but he also um, is a parallel line of research and inquiry. He's one of the leading authorities on research methods. He has 15 books. Um, probably half of those are in the area of research methods. Um, those books have been translated into a couple dozen languages and are being used all over the country and all over the world, going into multiple editions. Um, in this institution, within Teachers College, a decade ago, um, when a number of the um, places that had received Spencer Foundation grants for doctoral fellowships. We're um, developing a collective inquiry together about how to prepare graduate students for research. Um, Steve was centrally involved in that and um, wrote the report along with other faculty, but I think was the, the lead author and was the liaison to the national group of Spencer institutions, thinking about this very thing, the thing we're, we're gonna hear about today, which is the preparation of researchers. Um, he is, um, a past president of the National Association that represents uh, kinesiology as a field, so which is like the National Academy of Education or the National Academy of Sciences. So he's a distinguished scholar in his field. Um, he's been a department chair and a faculty leader here um, on numerous initiatives. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Steve Silverman. Well, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be speaking about this today. And um, at, as I talk about this, we will have time for questions at the end. Some of you know there will be wine afterwards, a perfect time to have more discussion as we're going. So today, I'm going to do some introductory con comments. And I'm going to talk a little about the context of research preparation. And I'm going to talk about preparing practitioners for using research. I'll talk about preparing researchers and some of the things we want to think about. And then I'm going to talk about some of the things I think we can do to help us prepare the next generation of research methods, faculty, and professors. Um, I'll have just very brief conclusions, and depending on the time, they may be really, really brief, and, and uh, we will have time for, for questions. So um, most of the discussions that I've really enjoyed in um, discussing research methods and talking to people about this have started uh, with my co-authors, um, Larry Locke, Juanine Spreduso, Jerry Thomas, and Jack Nelson. And Larry Wanin and I started um, a 30-some year uh, relationship writing edition after edition of, of a couple books here. And if any of you have been to Schultz Beer Garden in Austin, the first day and we, um, I was about a week away from starting as an assistant professor at the University of Texas. And we went to the upper left-hand corner of the beer garden in August in Austin and outside. 
and spent four and a half hours talking about some of the things I'll be talking about today. What is the voice? What, what do people need to know as we're doing things? And I thank uh, Larry, Juanine, Jerry, and Jack, because um, while there have been times we've had very uh, heated discussions and interesting things, they've helped inform my thinking probably more than other people. So I'm going to talk today, and this will be about um, my perspective. The, the research literature on teaching and pre uh, of research methods and preparing researchers is integrated in. Um, you'll, you'll see citations at the bottom, but I'm probably not going to be referring to that much. Um, the, I will focus mostly on big issues, then at times um, I'll do some detail and a little more molecular look at things. Um, this is coming from a wide perspective. At teachers colleges, we have a lot of different areas and a lot of uh, different foci. And so if we think about things like a neuroscience program versus a music program, there are adaptations either groups uh, would probably want to make in this. And clearly one thing anyone who's a faculty member at Teachers College knows is different people in programs will see things differently. And I'm happy to engage in that conversation. And um, I wanted to make the, the point that we're, I think we're already doing a good job in research training for the most part. What we need to do is look at how we can take it to the next level and where we're going. And so I'm going to be discussing some next steps, some things that we might cooperate across the college as, as we, we do this. So we can think of research preparation from a lot of different views. Um, generally, we think about it as preparing researchers most often. Um, doctoral educated people. Um, I gave a talk once where someone said, well, why should we think about other people in this? And I said, because normally we all think we want people to grow up like us, but not everyone wants to grow up like, like us. And so um, we also need to think about people who are going to be practitioners. We think of this much, much less often um, the, the literature has information about undergrads, masters, or doctoral educated people who are being practitioners. It has, um, there's a gigantic literature on physicians learning to use research in, in their practice. Um, that, that's very interesting and informative. And we want people, when they take positions um, to use research because it may help their professional practice. And so part of the context of that is that at Teachers College, we, we have five competency areas. Um, and the, you can see, see them. The two in the middle, inquiry and professionalism and lifelong learning, really relate to the preparation of practitioners to, to use research. And skill, um, our own website says use the skills inquiry, research critical th thinking, and problem solving to pursue and evaluate knowledge. And to, for our graduates to engage in the profession and take responsibility for, for their personal and professional growth. And so if we want the, the majority of students we prepare who are going to be practitioners, we probably want them to see research as one place they can go for knowledge. Just a couple other things to think about. Uh, the No Child Left Behind um, Act talked about scientifically based research on which um, to base research or evidence-based practice for teachers. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act that was just passed uh, calls for programs and interventions to be evidence-based. And if we want our students who are in situations where they're going to have to interact with people um, implementing 
um, interventions. We want them to be able to read that, think about it. Some states uh, require teachers to learn um, to find and evaluate information. There are ethics codes that require teachers to speak for, uh, to seek further knowledge. And I've only cited here New York State where we, we are and Pennsylvania where I was originally certified as a teacher, but just about every state has something like this uh, in, in their rules. And this is just, for example, across non-teaching areas where um, either their accreditation or certification or ethics code suggests that people who are in those professions need to uh, be able to find research, keep up to date on things as, as, they're, as they're going through. So we want our students to have the skills and attitudes to be successful, all right? And so one thing that's going to permeate throughout the rest of this talk is the idea that we need to think about differentiated research preparation. That if we're dealing with doctoral students and they're all the same sequence as master students, we likely are not accomplishing what, what we want. So I'm going to talk about practitioners first. And for people who are pursuing education for, for practice here, um, we want them to see research and research methods as something that's valuable. So every year when I start my research methods class in the fall, I figure two-thirds of them are there because their advisor said, you have to take this. And, and I, I want to set the bar a little higher than that with their enthusiasm. So I always say, my job this semester is to make you sound smart at a cocktail party. And that you should be able to read something about your field that other people have read at the New York Times in the New York Times and evaluate it and discuss it with other people. And about twice a year, I'll get an email from, from someone who will say, hey, I got to use that at a cocktail party. <laughs> if they're younger, they normally say, I got to use a drinking beer somewhere, but do, doing it. Um, we need to teach in a way that is appropriate to their goals, what they're thinking, okay? there's. Um, a great deal of research that suggests that when we have students in research methods classes who um, know they're never growing up to be researchers, and we keep talking about how, you know, when you do research and those kinds of things, that they typically dismiss what the teacher's talking about or what the professor's talking about. And so, we want to think about what their goals are and where they're going. Uh, we want to integrate experiences with research. As you'll see, I'll talk about some of the skills um, people who are practitioners likely will need, and um, that if we don't give them experiences to practice that, that they'll, they may never try it. And since we're undergoing a, a middle states assessment um, right now, one of the things we need to think about is um, building their research use into the assessments we do. So the students, um, as I, needs are important. As I said, most do not want to become researchers. Um, students want to we want students to, to understand and appreciate what goes into good research and what it can tell us and how to utilize it. Um, I often think that most students do not, and most of us, I hope, do not think that uh, research papers are bedtime reading. You know, they're, they're not so engaging all the time. And so we want is for people to know what to look for, how, how to find what they, they need as they're going through that. Um, 
I think this is key if we want people to utilize research um, once they graduate, is um, want to help them develop good attitudes towards research. And again, the research that is out there suggests that when we pretend that they want to become researchers like us, um, it tends to have a negative effect on their attitudes. If, if our students um, learn to read content but never use research again, we're not really helping them reach our goals or their needs and their goals. Um, I think that most of us would not want to go um, to a, phys a physician who has not read anything in 30 years. Um, and the same thing we should think about in, in the other areas that um, we, we're thinking about. So if we think about a first course that um, is geared towards master's students and that can be a springboard for doctoral students to move forward, a less really is more. Um, I, as I said, student attitude is important. And one of the things research has suggested is that overlearning -learn students are moving quickly through um, complex content makes it difficult for them to develop good attitudes. And so I'll give you an example. Um, I, I have a younger brother who was an, an educational administrator in Philadelphia. He took a research methods course at a very good graduate school of education, about 110 miles south of here. Um, and he had a class one time where they were trying to get all of these mid-career administrators to use research and talk about the applications, a very good goal. His group was assigned a structural equation modeling paper, and they had not discussed correlation in the class yet. And so he, they were told by the professor they could use any resource they had um, to find out more, and so he sent me the paper and we discussed it. But throughout his, his time, he just thought, you know, I don't really understand this. And he's smart, um, do, doing that had a very responsible position. So we wanna think about how to help people um, lear learn things. Um, Again, if, they, if people don't have the requisite knowledge, um, that's, that's very problematic. And you can see I probably have 10 or 12 um, citations at the bottom. I could have filled up five screens of the research suggesting that these principles are, um, are pretty true of dealing um, with introductory research methods classes for people. So the, the first course, is vital for all future classes and experiences. Um, some of the written course goals, and I know these aren't written as standardized learning objectives, but bear with me. Um, so I, I, I think in, a class, in, in an introductory class, what we want is people to get an overview of research methods that they can um, can read and evaluate a variety of, of methods. Um, they want to read, understand, and evaluate research. But again, this is from the perspective of the practitioner. So one of the things that we want to think about is how much detail do the students need about certain things, all right? So if, um, as you'll see, I'm going to say, um, I, when I teach this course, and as my co-authors and I in our reading and understanding research book recommend, that people can understand statistics conceptually. They can understand these t things, tell you whether these two means are, differently, are different. And then maybe they don't have to understand what went into the numerator and denominator when someone was calculating that to, to use the, the research. Um, obviously, to retrieve research, because if people are going to use this, I always tell students if they come to the library here, 
they'll let them in as alumni and they can bring, bring in a thumb drive and download every article the one for the next six months um, d doing that. We also want them to develop research related skills for further graduation, for further graduate education. That really depends on what they want to do when they're um, graduating. If they want to be a practitioner, that would be different than if they're, they're planning on being a, um, going on to, to a research program. So um, I have some unwritten course goals, and one is I want them to develop good attitude toward research and researchers. That often students come in and have a bad experience in these types of classes, and they kind of think that, you know, researchers can talk to normal people and they have no ability to communicate things and that they write in ways that um, are really difficult. And I think building into a course the idea of, you know, this is how research gets published. Think about someone trying to get it published. It, it might be the reviewers, not them, who made the decision to make this a sentence with 27 commas in it, um, do, doing it. And so we want them to think both of those. I also think we want our students to appreciate various research methods. Often some students come in and in eighth grade science, they learned about a control group and the scientific method, and that's really all they know about research. And in that case, they're not thinking about other research designs that might help them. Um, correlational research designs, prediction, all kinds of other experimental designs, and obviously qualitative research designs. We would like our students when they leave, um, when we're thinking of unwritten course goals, to represent us well um, when they discuss research or research methods. So I'm going to quickly, very quickly, go through what I think some of the course content should be. Um, introduction, understanding things about research reports and language. We all, many of us, read research papers all the time. and. Um, sometimes we get students who may have um, no experience reading research papers as we're thinking about it. Um, ethics, so they understand what researchers do and what they must go through to do, to do studies. Um, the phrase my co-authors and I use is knowing when to believe, when they should believe something in in a paper, and I think that really varies on what their purpose is, what they want when, when they're going through. Um, they, they need to learn how to retrieve from the library. Um, I always do an overview of research methods with talking about the questions, so they think about it in that way. Um, I, I, I do a and I, I think it's one thing we want. If they're going to be users, again, a conceptual overview of statistics. And our um, recently departed friend, Ann Gentile, once said to me, my master's students who have had your class understand what a repeated measure is better than people who have had statistics classes. And the fact is, you don't really have to understand a lot of statistics to understand what what that is. So a conceptual overview, what things do. They have to know what questions to ask when critically reading research. Um, the idea of what makes good data, that we don't just, you know, collect data and not, not think about issues of reliability, validity, trustworthiness, and credibility. These are some, in the class that I teach, the um, types of research designs that um, that I, I discuss with, with the students, um, where I have and others for other programs, obviously the emphasis might change. The, the class I teach is uh, people in kinesiology, nutri nutrition, neuroscience, and then 
um, some other areas of the college. So one of the things that we want to think about in these is we want to teach with an emphasis on the, on the um, consumer. And I, I, I first started switching how I taught research methods when I was at the University of Illinois. And it took me about two years to change my speech patterns from when you do research to when you read research in the class. And um, there, there actually has been some research that has suggested when we talk about them doing research, every time more of that said, students let, pay attention less. Um, I think that scaffolding to reinforce content uh, we want to provide things in manageable, manageable chunks. Um, use examples relevant to the students' interests and lots of them. I often think I look every semester at the examples on my PowerPoints and I change them based on who, who's in there. So if I have someone from science education or ed leadership, I just make up examples for them. And we, we want to... Um, provide opportunities for application in, in class. They uh, evaluate papers with an eye toward the practitioner. And we also want, um, in my class, that they have assignments where they have to explain research to others. It does two things. The difference of them evaluating it on paper and explaining it is a much higher level task. And secondly, when they explain it to others, they start to think, about the ideas uh, of research utilization. How, how can we use the research for things? And again, teach statistics um, conceptually. So um, if we want students to understand um, and utilize research, um, we, we really have to go to where they are and think about what knowledge and attitudes will help them <laughs> succeed. So pedagogy is important. Is important. Uh, professors need to have both um, content, pedagogical content, uh, knowledge, a wide variety. And one thing I've used in a lot of talks, research methods does not equal statistics in things. Sometimes that's what students think. Progressions are so very important in this. We have to think about a progression in this. And I've spent virtually my whole adult life teaching some type of aquatics. And if we taught swimming like we teach research methods, we would have a lot of trouble. And so we want to think about what we're doing. So I think one of the things we want to do in this regard is deal with issues of research utilization, facilitating research utilization, people taking research and, um, and, and um, being able to utilize it. And also, if people are becoming um, managers, supervisors, principals, department chairs, they, we would want them to facilitate utilization of others. So um, a research utilization experience would do things like developing self-confidence, having them think about barriers of fac and facilitators identify problems from the literature or from practice, and then work in groups and do it. Um, a lot of um, areas have, um, particularly nursing and other medical fields, that's a requirement for students to get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, where they work in groups, they take a paper and a pipe. And we also want to think about research um, facilitation. So this might require some background in adult education or di diffusion theory. They want to think about um, how to, to, to get help people utilize um, things. And these are just some of the things that have been used in the literature and college courses. Um, they need to have, like anything, we, people need to practice something if they're going to do it. And then finally, one of the things the literature recommends is uh, project-based assignments for, for, for this. Um, 
And, and of course, here, different programs and departments may think about this differently, do, doing it. And again, differentiation. So I'm going to move on to the preparation of researchers. And we think about this um, a, a lot more. And this um, preparation may be specific to an area of study, but I think there are commonalities. Learning about methods, learning about analysis, and so forth. There may be data collection techniques that are very specific, but uh, there are some commonalities in this. And we want to think when we're preparing researchers about ha having the skills, attitudes, and capacity uh, that, our, that our students have the skills, attitude, and capacity to do research. Um, in our book about writing dissertation proposals, we suggest that if people have a really horrible experience writing a dissertation, that is probably not going to help them want to do research in the future. Um, obviously, this um, goes beyond courses. Um, we, we absolutely need to be flexible in helping students realizing everyone does not learn at the same rate or develop skills. And I think as an institution, we want to think about the courses, apprenticeships, experiences, and other opportunities um, that, that, um, that we have. And again, differentiation is an important aspect of this. So as Tom said, I, I was a participant on, on the Spencer Foundation Task Force um, that developed um, recommendations for the preparation of um, educational researchers. And we basically had four areas we thought that people should be prepared in to, to be researchers. And one of the things that was interesting, we thought the that number one research paradigms, how to do research, was our charge. And Dennis Phillips uh, of Stanford, who chaired this committee, the first night, we were at a bar to meet each other. And, and he had us use post-it notes to write down what else was there we thought people needed. Um, before the next morning, someone collated that. Um, and um, there were four areas. Um, social context, which deals with understanding your field in, in an, a, a beyond research paradigm, so I'll talk about it in a second. Social context, understanding your field, um, have, a, and how it fits into society, and also having some experience if it's a teaching field or something like that. Substantive disciplinary knowledge, people can't do research if they don't know about the other research. And one that came up that, that I also will talk about is professional practice. How do people become professors? What do they do when they're professors? So talk about that in a minute. This is small, because when I started putting it in the other font, it took up four sides. And so you can see from this, there are a lot of things people might need to know about research paradigms. And we as a group thought that some of the ones in the middle, consumer conceptual understanding of research, um, quantitative methods and qualitative methods. Everyone should have experience in both, but they should have in-depth knowledge in the other. And um, we also, on the right-hand side there, have um, experiences that people should have if they're going to be prepared to be researchers. And uh, most of those are things you've seen. The four at the bottom that are now in yellow um, per, per, proposing research, presenting research, writing for publication, and grant writing are things that we really put under the professional practice part. But these are things I think we'll want to think about here. And just so um, if we look at this, um, I think a reading and understanding research course, like I discussed a little while ago, can be followed by lots of different courses in planning research, data collection, data analysis, and reporting research. Um, when we're doing that, 
And some of those arrows are broken because they can go in, in, um, in, in lots of different orders. So at TC, we've looked at research courses a lot. So I've been here 18 years. We, um, I chaired the Research Literacy Task Force at one time, and then we had a research advisory committee that had four or five different um, versions. We had two compendium of research courses, one the Research Literacy Task Force did and one that Kathleen O'Connell did. And then after, um, a, a, as we had a um, Spencer Research Training Grant, we had lots of, decision, or lots of discussions of, about research training. And generally, I think, based on this, we, we have lots of areas uh, for possibilities to, to have discussion. And so some of the areas, thinking about courses, sequences, and offerings of our courses. Uh, what are we missing to help our students? I think um, we, we do a lot of different things here that we might want to look at doing it. Um, sequences and qualitative courses that go beyond one course. Thinking about uh, statistics courses that when they're offered, how they're offered, the, the tone uh, of those that we, we, and thank you all who are nodding right now for doing that. Um, and um, so we want to think about it from helping our students. One of the things a lot of our peers do that we haven't done as much is um, mini courses, non-credit courses, weekend courses, where if any of you, um, I, I've been at AERA to pre-conference courses that meet a full day and you learn how to get data out uh, on a technique or do, doing things. And um, we, we've um, now have ways at TC of sort of not having to deal with a three credit or two credit course program and we should be thinking about that. Um, so th this is for really um, data analysis classes. We, we, I think we want to think about the difference between a research practitioner versus someone needing um, complete the theoretical um, understanding for something. Okay, so to get a MANOVA out of SPSS and understand the printout is different than understanding how the original formula was derived using matrix algebra. And so we probably want to think about um, the tone of courses, where we're going with that. Um, we also want to think about where courses need to be program and department specific and where they don't. There are some courses that clearly that makes sense and other places where it might not make so much sense. And one thing that um, our friends here in um, educational leadership have started to do is look at alternatives for people who are going for doctoral degrees who, but are requiring um, researchers, but they're really going to be practitioners. How, how can we make the dissertation requirement meaningful for, for people? And I often think that um, Jill Biden has a doctorate, as you all know, and if you, if you go to the library or in your library on screen, you can download her dissertation. And hers was in community college leadership, and it was a very practical um, dissertation that um, analyzing things at the community college she was at when she did that. So I think there are lots of, of possibilities like that and we've started that already. All right, so I'm not going to talk about social contexts or substantive disciplinary knowledge because um, all of you understand um, a lot your areas in that way better than I do. But I'm going to talk about professional practice. And as I said, when we're at a bar in Chicago, this one we came, came up with and it, um, 
it really is what, what do um, graduates need to be successful once they assume postgraduate positions? The role of the faculty member. Some of the things in there are service, departmental service, university service. Often assistant professors think that they're supposed to say yes to whatever's occurring. And the fact is that might not, or whatever they're asked to do, that might not be a good, good decision. Working with colleagues, um, how do they do that and interact? And advising of, um, uh, of, of students. It, it's interesting that after this report came out, and Susan was there that day, Elizabeth Moji at Michigan and I did a talk to a group of people who had had um, Spencer dissertation fellow fellowships. And the, these are very highly coveted, very good people. And so Elizabeth and I are talking about this. All of these people, except one, was an assistant professor at the time. And advising was the thing. And if they said anything in that two hours we were with them, it was, why didn't anyone tell me how much time this was going to take and how hard it is to figure out? And so we want the expectations of our graduates um, to, to be able to think, think about those things. Um, there are tons of ways to get out. Brown, um, brown bags, seminars, coffees, post-seminar drinks, as people are... Um, thinking about discussing those things. Um, I think the one thing we want to do is integrate this into our programs and be proactive about it. If we're not proactive, it probably won't happen. And uh, we want to create a culture of science where future graduates are socialized into the research role. But we also want them to be successful. If they're not understanding the rest of their role, um, it's probably going um, to make it um, much longer time before um, they can be successful with their research. Um, we, we have lots of different programs, and again, some issues can be addressed across the college, and others are program and department specific. I have to say one of the things, um, when I coordinated that research training grant, we did topics for graduate students. Um, who wanted to become faculty members. And the students who were being funded off, this, off of this created them and did the advertisement. It didn't matter what we talked about. If we had guest speakers there, they, um, they came. We were talking about how to get your research career off to a start, how, how to go on a job interview, how, how to be successful managing your time as a young reader. Everything um, was, was sold out. And so if we think about those, I think a lot of those we can think about as an in institution. And we want to think as, as a group about um, how we move forward to, to help us meet our students and career aspirations. Um, my watch has a different time than the watch here. So am I over? OK. Um, I'm going to quickly then talk about the last part. This says um, 508. Um, and so extending our influence. Um, one of the things we want to think about is teaching and pedagogy of research methods. And one, one of the things is that new professors are often assigned to teach introductory research methods. And it's one of the few courses where they may not be a specialist in that. Um, often, people teaching research methods course do not have any preparation, content, pedagogy, pedagogical content knowledge. It has a rippling effect on their students. They teach the course they didn't like that they had over to their students. And as we've discussed it before, pedagogy is important. And uh, there's a very large literature on teaching research methods. And so we want to think about how to integrate that, that in. And one of the things I've thought about a lot over the last couple years is um, if we want to extend our influence, um, we want to think about offering a class on teaching research methods. 
Um, you can see some of the content in there, but students who can go out, have thought about it, have worked on syllabi and so forth, um, and have taught things, um, include mentored practica within this, and have our graduates leave um, with the knowledge of pedagogy, assessment, content, all kinds of other things. And again, this will give um, our graduates be able to pass on to their graduates uh, confidence for using research in professional practice. So as I said, I'm gonna go real quick. Um, we've done a good job um, and we, we um, need to think about other things. And so some of the things I've talked about, um, we may want to think about and, and address at Teachers College. So now, questions. Yeah. Um, they want you to talk there because it's being recorded. And I, I promised Tom I would not say any words Donald Trump has used out loud while it's being recorded. Hi, thank you, Dr. Silverman. I took your course like 14 years ago. Not, oh. not that we're that old. I mean, you were like 16, a child prodigy at the you time. You look the so. same. <laughs> um, thanks very much for this. I've given this a lot of thought. I'm a, I'm a doctoral student in nutrition and education. And I, I feel as though um, there's a couple of things that challenge me, and I, I've taken all my research, all my courses now. I feel like when I go to... Uh, you know, write an article or read an article or explain an article to students who I teach, I feel like it's, it's easy for me, I guess, as a doctoral student who looks at articles all the time to be able to sort of translate that. But it's only after years and years of doing it as a doctoral student. What I think is missing is that integration between research methods and statistics and the fact that, you know, you can take research methods and sort of roughly understand, you know, as you said, an overview. And then you get to statistics and it could literally be almost exactly what you were looking at um, in more detail. Um, you know, sort of the, like you said, the formulas behind what you were looking at in research methods, but you don't necessarily even identify that with what you just learned. And that's so unfortunate because you spend so much time calculating things. In How can we make that better um, for students? I have to say, if we're talking about the teaching, I, I think separate issue, practitioners using research, because we can teach them in a way that helps them understand and, and read paper. I think there are, um, the, the, the bullet point I had about thinking about um, how we prepare researchers in statistics, whether they're going to be practitioners or, or need theory in that. But, I, but I also, I've always felt that um, there was a time when calculating statistics in statistics class was a necessity. I'm old enough that um, I had statistics with only a four function calculator. Um, and I thought that was great. When they came out with the square root key, I thought it was even better. Um, and, but, I, you know, we, we need to think about what students are going to do, how they're going to use. I think there are ways that we can teach statistics where people, um, anyone can figure out how to use SPS very easily, but then the job is how, how do they interpret printouts, how, how do they explain what they've gotten out of that or see, see that. And I think um, there are lots of people who have written about sort of, you know, except for one time people really don't need to know what an F ratio is that the variance terms in, in the denominator. And so I think we can think about other ways of teaching that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, I don't have a mic, can I speak loudly? Sure, I'll repeat the question. I'm curious, your perspective. Thanks. I'm curious as to your perspective, and if you can speak on behalf of the institution, on alternate forms of research, multimodal, um, non-text-based scholarly research, and and where it where it can be used for those of us who are conducting research in an age where dissemination has really changed, or the frameworks for dissemination. 
and also with an eye on access, um, broadening access, who's reading research. We want more people to read the research that we generate. All right, so those are really two different things. Yeah. The, the first one, um, now I probably can't speak on behalf of the, the institution. If Tom weren't here, I might try um, to, to do that. But, uh, but I think that's something to consider. I, I, I have been to sessions at AERA where um, people have done, like, essentially plays about the results of their research that I have found fascinating, where they've integrated theory and stuff into it. The, I think the problem that we need to think of is, is how do we do that in a way that, um, you know, we can evaluate it and, and, um, and, and see if it's, it's done well for that. And the second question, oh, about reading research. All right, so I, I, I think there are, our, if our expectation is that most people are going to read research articles, they're probably, that's probably not gonna happen. And so we have to think of different ways of dissemination. And um, I've always thought that one of the things that we might wanna think about in a lot of the areas here is, um, when I was at, I, I grew up in an urban environment, I didn't know they had cooperative extension services where people who have doctorates understand the research, go out and help farmers and ranchers um, um, do their jobs, and they interpret research. And I think that different fields want to think about how to reward people for interpreting research and, and d doing things. Um, I, I've edited a couple books that have been designed for physical education teachers to, um, to talk about what the research says in different areas. And that requires people writing differently. Um, I, I learned the hard way that um, when I do talks to supervisors and teachers and principals, um, no one cares about the method. You know, and so you want to present what they're interested in doing. So I think there are lots of ways to think about that. But Tom will be there for wine afterwards if you want to ask him that. Okay. Kathleen. Well, I can throw it to you. That was good. If Kathleen had had a good physical education teacher, she would have had better efficacy about catching that. Oh, that's true. I had no efficacy about catching anything. Uh, thanks, Steve. That was, that was great. And um, I have been uh, Steve's student about how to teach research methods for about 15 years since I've been here at the college. So, um, uh, and I uh, always appreciate his take on things. Uh, I think one of the challenges I have in teaching research methods and teaching my other courses is the problem with, uh, at least in the fields that I'm in, nursing, health, uh, the really good studies published in really good journals use very complicated statistics. Mm -hmm. The really bad studies published in practitioner journals usually uh, are, and I always say this, that's the dirty little secret of research that uh, Bad studies that you can't get published anywhere else often go in practitioner journals. Anyway, so I was wondering if there's any way you can try to try to get at. I mean, so many of the you know we're talking about your brother and the and the uh, and the complex design, the complex statistics. Well, statistics is just getting more and more complex every day, and uh, I'm I'm just not how sh I'm not sure how to bridge that gap. You have any ideas? Yeah, I think people might, I think about a structural equation model. They probably don't need to know that there are you know, two types of fit statistics, that there are path coefficients. What they need to know is that these things predict each other and that we want to try to teach things in a way that they can do that. And I think that there's an awful lot 
of the detail that they can find out later if they want, if they're having. And I'll, I'll often say to people, if you have the general idea, this is predicting this, they're, they're testing means, they, they analyzed interview transcripts in this way, that you know, they can get a general idea and ask other questions um, about that. Um, I don't, there, you know, there's no way they can get the detail in one course. And again, the, so the idea that less is more. Yeah, do you tell them to skip the statistics? No, I tell <laughs> them to think about them in conceptual yeah. terms. Okay. This is predicting this. This is testing means doing this. I tell them often if, like, it's complex MANOVA doing it. Read the topic sentence of the paragraph. That's going to tell you what the differences are. And you can look at whether it's significant or not, what, which of the dependent variables were significantly different. They don't really need to know to read the statistics to go away with the idea that this is you know, testing means and doing that. But it's hard, because sometimes um, you know, I'll, I'll have students who have had one statistics course who think they know a lot more statistics than they do. And, you know, it, 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 and I have to say, well, you know, you, that, in order to understand this concept, it's um, four more stat courses. If you want me to tell you which ones come to my office, I'd be happy to help you take them. And no one takes me up on that. <laughs> there was a question back there. Thank you. So I have a quick question. I am a second semester EDM student here, and I'm finding myself um, in this weird middle place of knowing that I would like to continue with an advanced degree um, that's will involve a lot of research. However, I'm finding that there aren't a lot of spaces for master's students to interrogate that and ask the questions that might seem pedestrian. So I'm wondering if you can speak to entry points for MA or EDM students where they can and are welcome to try this out because the next step is a huge, is a huge step, but I would imagine that I'd have to, you'd have to navigate this comfortably at this point before you go. I, I really think away. it depends on your program. Okay. And that, as you said, is a very large step because being prepared to do good research requires a lot of training. And, and I often think that when people um, take a one semester course where they never learned about research methods and they have to do a research proposal and all these other things, that's not, we're teaching them the wrong things about research. You know, we, doing that, but I, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I'm sure people in your program would too. Thank you. Um, it, it's time for drinks since I went over. So let's go in the other room and have some wine. And thank you very much. Thank you.